Welcome to another episode of our virtual tutorial classes on the Durham College e-learning platform. Uh, this presentation is for the first semester students of English school under the new education policy. Now, we are in the unit one of this uh, paper, which is medieval and Renaissance period of the paper that is titled English Literary and Social History. So we are doing medieval and Renaissance period, but in this particular class, we are concentrating on the medieval period. And at, at the moment, we are actually doing one of the poets of the great individual writers period, that is 1350 to 1400, William Langley. We have titled it as William Langley and his Pyrrhus Plowman. In our previous slides, we have discussed Geoffrey Chaucer and John Gower. Now, William Langley actually completes the trial of those great individual writers of the Middle English period. So we are uh, here uh, ready to go on a uh, search for the poetry of uh, William Langland. First, an introduction of the poem. Uh, as we have already said, in fact, we have been repeating this, Lang William Langland is a member of the trio of great individual writers of the late 14th century, that is 1350 to 1400. The other two great poets of the period are Chaucer and Gower, Geoffrey Chaucer and John Gower. William Langland has to be studied from two perspectives, actually. Two things are very important in locating William Langland's poetry. First of all, he represents the social and moral protest of the 14th century. We know the Middle English period uh, saw a rise in discontent and protest. Uh, a number of events took place, which actually led to this uh, environment, led to this milieu. And the protest is reflected in the literature of the time as well. And William Langland's poetry is at the forefront of this protest. So his poetry comes under the category of literature of protest. Secondly, he is also important as part of that alliterative revival of the 14th century. Now, what is this alliterative revival? We know that the old English poets used uh, what is called uh, uh, alliteration, a particular sound patterning device. Their sounds are patterned uh, in this way. That is, uh, consonant sounds are repeated at the beginning of stressed syllables, or we can say stressed uh, words. Now, this repetition of consonant sounds at the beginning of a word or a stressed syllable is called alliteration. This alliteration was the common meter or measure of the Old English poets. But Subsequent to the Norman conquest, we saw the influence of Romance literature coming into Germanic literature. Now, as a result of that literature, uh, of that influence, what happened was that certain new elements, new forms, new devices, new concepts came into English literature. One very conspicuous element, which comes as a result of the French influence, is the replacement of alliteration with rhyme. Now, Middle English poetry is noted for the use of rhyme. In fact, it is famously said that Chaucer, uh, in fact, ridiculed the alliterative line and Chaucer in his poetry used rhyme. But just as rhyme replaced alliteration in the mid Middle English period, we also see a reversal in this late 14th century. That reversal is in the form of a revival of the alliterative meter. There are poems like Wiener and Waster, Parliament of Ages, which were written in the conventional alliterative meter. Now, Langland's poetry is also written uh, with this particular sound patterning mode, which is called alliteration. So along with being the representative of the protest literature of the age, Langland also represents the alliterative revival of the 14th century or the late 14th century to be precise. Now, Langland's claim to fame the greatest of the alliterative poems that came up in the late 14th century is, of course, thanks to William Langley. His Pyrrhus Plowman is considered to be the most significant example of the alliterative revival. Of course, Pyrrhus Plowman is the shortened title, and this short title is uh, famous, of course. But the full title of the poem is The Vision of William Concerning Pyrrhus the Plowman. This is the poem that actually uh, places William Langland in that uh, stature, in that uh, great 
uh, realm of the great individual writers. It is this poem that represents the social protest and as well as representing itself as one of the poems uh, representing the alliterative revival of the time. Now, coming to the genre, what kind of a poem is uh, Pires the Plum? Now, Pires the Plowman can be categorized under different heads, actually. They, and these different categories intersect, they overlap. The same poem can be looked at from different viewpoints. Uh, it is a frame tale, no doubt, and we know the frame tale is a popular literary genre in the medieval period. Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales is a frame tale. John Gower's poetry also uses the frame tale mode. Now, frame tale, we have said earlier, uh, is, a, is a tale that has an outward or outer tale, a frame uh, narrative that holds other narratives within it. And that, now, Pires the Plowman is such a narrative. Now, here, what happens? The poet falls asleep. Uh, he actually goes out on a May morning and falls asleep. Uh, and that is the uh, that is the frame narrative. And in, in his sleep, he has a dream. And because the story is told in the form of a dream, it is called a dream vision, another popular literary genre of the medieval period. Now, Pires the Plowman, of course, also is an allegory. Now, allegory is a narrative which can be interpreted at different levels. There is, of course, the literal level at which we can enjoy the narrative, but it uh, submits itself to other interpretations. An allegory has uh, more than one signification. Uh, uh, usually, the allegorical signification is at a moral level or at a political level. Now, the characters, the theme, and the setting, uh, besides being literal, they also represent something else. Now, in this uh, way, Pires the Plowman, Langland's poem is a moral allegory. Uh, it, it tells a literal story, no doubt, which also can be uh, a good narrative. It's a tale that can uh, uh, entertain us or that can teach us. But at the same time, there is another level at which it can be interpreted. So it's a frame tale. It's a dream vision. It's an allegory. Plus, uh, we saw that this is a poetry. It is a poem of protest. It, it actually attacks conventional society and its mores. Now, uh, it's a scathing criticism of the society of the time. So it's a satire. So uh, we, you see, it can, it, the poem can fall uh, under a number of headings. It's a satire, then it's, of course, it's, it, is, it is enthused by a religious zeal. It tells the story, story of the real Christian way of life. And it's a protest against the against the degeneration, against the corruption, against the against the exploitation, and all that was not well with the way of the world in the medieval period. So these are the categories under which we can place uh, Langland's Pires the Plowman. Now, Pires the Plowman was a very popular poem of the Middle English period, and this popularity is uh, evidenced by the fact that there are uh, available multiple versions of the poem. Uh, multiple versions are extant. Now, the three extant texts are uh, A text, B text, and C text. They are called so, uh, respectively. And from internal evidences, that is from the poems themselves or the versions themselves, we get the uh, dates or years of their writing or publication. And they are given in the uh, on the slide, actually. The 1362, 1377, and 1398, respectively. These are the years in which the successive versions were released. Now, continuing with the versions, we, we see that these different versions, the three versions, are actually incremental advancements. The first text consists of 2,579 lines with a prologue or an introduction and 11 cantos or passes. Now, the next, the B text, uh, is a much longer poem, 7,241 7, lines, again with a prologue, but now 20 passes. C text, 7353 lines, again with a prologue and 23 passes. Each successive version, you will see, is a revision and continuation. These are all deeply religious and reveal full knowledge of the wretchedness of the people, the misery of the people. So Langlen is here talking about the wretched of the earth. The poem represents the anger against the vices of society, Christian only in name. This is the allegorical interpretation of the poem. 
it, it represents the vices of society, Christian only in name. So the society is straying away from its right path. That is what the poem rules or complains about. It gives us a picture of the world as it is, and then the picture of the world as it should be. That, that is where lies the satire. And that is where we see the irony of it. Uh, and the poem is uh, infused with the passion of the poem. Yeah, poet, sorry. It's a, it's a passionate poem denouncing the way of the world. Now, the form and content of the poem pires the plummet. Now, we have already hinted actually as, at, the, at both the form and content of the poem. Now, the narrative is such. One May morning, the poet is in shepherd's dress falls asleep by a stream on the Melbourne Hills. He sees a vision of a field full of folk. Now that phrase, filled full of folk, is very significant. Now that is uh, what alliteration is. Repetition here of the four sound, which is a consonant sound at the beginning of the words. Now this is the uh, alliterative revival. This is the common measure of old English poetry replaced later on by French rhyme. Once again, now coming back, enjoying a reversal of fortunes. Now the title of the poem itself, the shortened title, Pires the Plume itself is an example of alliteration. So by now you well understand what alliteration is. Now Lady Holy Church appears and exhorts them to seek truth. Now this is the allegory. Now here the characters are personified abstractions actually. Lady Holy, Holy Church represents the Christian way of life and truth, are, truth and work are abstractions that are personified in the poem. But no one knows the way. Now, Peter the Plowman, Peter the Plowman, or Pyrus the Plowman. Pyrus the Plowman allegorically at some points of the poem represents Saint Peter. At some points is Christ himself. Uh, this is the rich allegory of the poem. And uh, Pyrus offers them to be their guide, provided they help him plow the half acre. Those who refuse are forced to work through hunger. There are other narratives in the frame. Pyrus is now a true Christian, Christian now Christ himself. Now, essential virtues of work and love are what are presented or represented in the poem, uh, reinforcing the idea of the illegal. And the uh, mode of true Christian life. This is the moral allegory of the poem. This is the religious zeal in the, in the poem of William Langland. Now, to sum up, William Langland as a poet and his stature and his importance in the Middle English literature. He represents, as we have said, the anger and protest of his age. We have seen earlier that the middle, uh, the 14th century, the late 14th century especially, we see uh, a ferment in the society. We see uh, a lot of discontent. A number of events have occurred, which actually leads people to this discontent, dissatisfaction, anger, and protest. Starting with the uh, black death and the suffering, sufferings, the corruption of the church, the, uh, the hundred years war and the subsequent taxation, the suppression of the aspirations of the peasants, the statutes of laborers to keep wages under control. Now, the, all these resulted in the anger, resulted in the discontent. And uh, 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 through Langland, this discontent gets its uh, venting. Now, his poem is a hard hitting satire on society which is Christian only in name. That, that is where it is religious, that is where it's a satire. In form, the poem is a frame tale where the frame narrative of the poet going out and falling asleep holds other narratives. The device of the dream makes it a dream vision. The narratives can be interpreted as moral allegory, as, as we have seen, essential virtues of work and love of truth and of true Christian life are represented. Now, these are illiterative lies. That is a significant point. Now, why does uh, these protest poems use the illiterative measure? Now, they are actually connected. The fact that the poem is a protest poem and the fact that it uses alliteration are not random things. They are connected. They are not arbitrary. What is the connection? Now, this is a protest poem. Protest against whom? Protest against the elites. Protest against the powerful. Protest against the ruling classes. Protest against the court. So, in the protest against these upper echelons of the society, the poet uses the device of the common people, device of the uh, lower classes, device of those who are suffering. So the, he discards the courtly rhyme and he uses the ordinary uh, people's 
meter that is the alliteration that is the connection between the protest of the poem and the sound patterning of the poem so we can say in pyrus the plowman actually the uh, medium itself is the message the medium he uses tells us a lot about what the poem's content uh, content is so that was a brief uh, presentation of William Langland and his contribution to poetry in the Middle English period. Now, in our earlier slides, we had uh, discussions on Geoffrey Chaucer and John Gower. Now, Langland uh, completes the trio of the three great individual writers. This gives us a 360 degree panoramic view of the development of poetry in the Middle English period. Uh, which had its high point in the great individual writers period that is 1350 to 1400. We saw Chaucer, how he represents the uh, A's in uh, form and content, how Gower represents the fears of the A's, and how now we have seen how Langland represents the anger of the A's, and he represents it in a, in a, in a medium which is of the common people, that is alliteration. So I hope this uh, uh, short presentation will help you understand uh, not only Langland's poetry, but also the, give you an overall glimpse uh, supplemented by our uh, earlier presentations of the poetry of the Middle English period. So we hope to meet again in this kind of virtual tutorial classes, continuing with our uh, foray into Middle English literature. So thank you.